there's a graph of g of x. So now we're given something in function notation, but it's not a graph that we recognize. It's just a bunch of lines put together. Sketch the image graph after each translation. What we call moving a graph left, right, up, and down is a translation. So if you like highlighting new definitions or new math words, oh, or hoping your pen works, looks like my pen is not working, imagine I took out a highlighter and imagine I highlighted translation. Write the equation of the image graph in terms of the function f, a uh, function g. Really, there's my highlighter. Okay, so I wanted to highlight this. I also wanted to highlight this. Because when we go through a question, when you're in class, it is so easy just to watch me do it and then go, okay, I get it, I get it. Because it's easy to understand as I'm doing it and as I'm explaining it. I have that tendency, this, you'll say to yourself, that makes sense. But sometimes you get to a quiz or a test and you'll be like, oh, I do not remember what does in terms of the function g mean. If I asked you to do that right now, most of you would just stare at your paper and go, I don't know what that means, I'm just going to leave it blank and wait for the teacher to show me. Or how many people feel really comfortable writing a function in terms of g right now? Probably not very many. And what that means is that if you don't pay attention to these instruction words while we're learning, when you get to your quiz, you're going to have that same feeling. I don't know what this means. And when you don't know what, what instructions mean in math, then all of a sudden the whole question becomes very hard just because we don't understand the English behind it or the language behind it. So we're going to look at what does it mean to write an image graph in terms of a function g and then state the domain and range of each function. First one, it's a translation of four units left. That is really easy to do. Here's our graph. Could you move that graph four units to the left? Yes, really easy. I'd probably take this point, one, two, three, four. Take this point, one, two, three, four. This one, one, two, three, four and one, two, three, four. Then play connect the dot, which you probably haven't been able to do since like grade two. And we've got our graph. Drawing it four units to the left, really easy. The equation in terms of the function g. Well, if we're moving something left and right, it's going to be inside the function. My new graph here in blue y equals, in terms of the function g, my function g has been moved 4 to the left. That shows up by writing g of x plus 4. When it says in terms of the function g, that means on the right-hand side of your equation, you need to have the function g. It needs to be there. Sometimes you'll get questions that say in terms of x. That means on the right-hand side of your equation, you need an x somewhere. It needs to have that in its equation. This one was in terms of the function g. So g, the function g needed to be on the right-hand side of our equation. What happened to the function g? It got moved 4 to the left. How does that show up? Well, that's inside the function. And everything left and right, if I moved it 4 to the left, it shows up as opposite, right? x plus 4 instead of x minus 4. I did that one in blue. I'm going to switch colors here. A translation of one unit up. Well, again, that's easy to draw. Just take each of these points and shift them up one unit and connect the dots. What does that look like as an equation in terms of the function g? Well, that would look like g of x plus 1, and that plus 1 happens outside of the function because we moved it up 1. 
and my equation is in terms of g because I have g of x on the right hand side. Domain and range for my blue graph. So I like to, I just write a little d for domain, r for range. Remember that domain are your x values. So in this case, our x values, our smallest x value is negative 5, and our biggest x value is 2. So we include all the x values from negative 5 to 2. There's two ways that you can write that. One way is in set notation, where you write negative 5 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 2. This is called set notation. And the other way of writing the same thing is interval notation. where you write it as an interval with a starting point and an ending point. So we start at negative 5, we end at 2, and we use a square bracket because negative 5 is included, and a square bracket because 2 is included. We'll see in examples later on, if a value is not included, we use a round bracket. This is called interval notation. Do you have to know them both? Yes. Okay. Whenever a question is asked for you to write the domain, you get to choose. You get to choose which notation you would like to use, and both are acceptable. The reason you have to know both is because you might get a question which gives you the domain in interval notation or gives you the domain in set notation. And if you don't know how to read it, you won't be able to understand the question. Generally, if a question starts in set notation, it's generally expected that you answer in set notation. It's sort of like proper etiquette, but it wouldn't be wrong if you answered it in the other way. So same thing now for our range, for our blue graph. Our smallest y value is positive 2. Our largest y value goes all the way up to here positive 5, so we could in set notation write from 2 to 5, or in interval notation, square bracket from 2, square bracket 5. So in interval notation, it's always starting with a minimum value and going to a maximum value, and it means we'll include everything in between. So there's my domain and range for my blue graph. We we're asked for the domain and range for each of them, so I'm going to switch colors now to green. Now my domain for my green graph, my smallest value is negative 1. My largest x value is 6. So I could write it like this. Or like that. And for my range, smallest y value for my green graph is 3. The largest y value for my green graph is 6. Now, one of the things I'm also going to do when I work through a question is I'm going to model some of the good practice that you should do when you're doing a question on a quiz or a test. So in this case, when you're done a question, right, the next thing you should do is read the question again. 
especially in this one, this question asked us to do three things. Here's the graph. It first asked us to sketch. Have we done that? Yes, we have. After sketching it, it's asked us to write the equation in terms of g. We've done that as well. And then finally, state the domain and range of each function. You're going to find sometimes when you do a question on a quiz, as soon as you get to that first word and you see sketch, you're like, yes, I know how to do this. And you go right away and you sketch the graph. You feel so good. And once you're done, you're like, yeah, I'm just going to go to the next question. You will do that. You will read part of the question and go and leave other parts blank. So it's important to read things over again. Of all your subjects, math is the subject where you have to read things over. Usually I say question for you should read a question two or three times every time you do it. Okay? Can you imagine if that was like that for English? Here's your Shakespeare. Make sure you've read it three times. Oh, it's hard enough just to read it once. Right? So in English, you just have to, mostly you just have to read things once. Maybe in some other subjects you've learned, oh, I shouldn't put this on video, but like in history, just read the first sentence and the last sentence of every paragraph, and you'll get it. You can save so much time. Probably shouldn't have put that on video, but I'm pretty sure the history teachers aren't watching. And history is my minor. I liked history, so I can make fun of it a little bit. But some things you don't have to read very much, right? Here's a good thing for reading. You just got a new thing on, on uh, you know, you're downloading a new program. Before you can download it, they give you this 20-page document where you have to hit agree. How much of that do you read before you hit agree? None. We all just go to the bottom, hit agree. They could put lots of bad stuff in there, but we never know because we just go and hit agree right away. So some things you don't need to read very much, but math you do need to read over and over and over again because there's lots of little details in a math question and every little word can change what they're asking for. So we really pay a lot of attention to detail. So what's going to happen in class is we're going to do an example like this. We've written it off to the side so you can get a sense to see what are the things that I need to write when I do a question. There's the question in your notes right beside it that explains things more, but it has more words than you would need to write down if you were doing the question yourself. Then after we do a question, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you, you are now able to do the questions from homework, which are four, five, six, and seven. And what is going to happen is I'm often going to give you time to start those. Probably not enough time to finish them all, but get a sense to start them. So just to get to know how you use your book, we'll now turn to your homework. Sometimes what people do is they write four, five, six, and seven here, then turn to their homework and go to question four and circle it, question five and circle it, question six, circle it, question seven, circle it, because those are ones you should be able to do now. And then we take some time to actually get started on those. So if you have questions, you can ask them. The nice thing about this book as well, so on page 169 is where question four is. And then you don't have to flip very far, but just at the end of the questions, which is on page 176, the answers are just there at the end. So you don't need to go all the way to the back of your textbook to find the answers. You can find your answers right away. Now, I suggest when you're doing a question, do a couple, then check the answers right away because you don't want to be practicing something wrong and getting really good at doing it wrong before you realize you're doing it wrong. So make sure you're checking and asking questions. So we'll take a little bit of time to do that right now.